Boston sound. I can't find the time to tell you. I can't find the time to tell you. I think that but for one letter, it could have been different. One letter being, if it was the Boston Sounds, we may have been um, received better than we were. Because there were a lot of bands that were developing. Caldwell Winfield Blues Band, Listening, Fluff. Um, I mean, there are just dozens and dozens of bands. After that first wave of Ultimate Spinach, Beacon Street Union, Orpheus, there were dozen of, dozens of other bands that were, were signed. And there was not a sound. Because each band had its own kind of sound. Some of it was extreme. I mean, most of it. Most all of it, inclusive of the Rolling Stones in some ways, is derivative of what came before it. Rolling Stones were a regurgitation of the Chicago blues scene. But they, they morphed it. They molded it into something different, along with the, what they looked like and how they dressed in the times. It, it appealed to a new generation. My love is violet blossoms tender to the touch You will surrender to me Within the realm of hearts embracing Don't you realize you're facing ecstasy It was like somebody stole our identity and represented us as something we really They were coming to put together an album. There had been this influx at that time of what they called the Bostown sound. Uh, and then there was Timothy Clover in 67, I think, which was sort of the psychedelic stuff. It was, it was the East Coast response to Eight Miles High by the birds or whatever, um, which was not at all our sound by any stretch. Um, but, um, and because of it, I think that was one of the reasons I began to move away from the band and decided it's time to go back. You know, it was Alan Lorber. He had signed those two bands. He got together with Wes. They packaged it together. They sold it to MGM. Somebody at MGM had this crazy idea that they were going to create the Boston sound like the San Francisco sound, even though the three bands didn't sound anything alike and didn't even know each other. Talk about the San Francisco sound. What are you kidding? That was like a community. And Alan Lorber was was at the beginning stages of putting together a marketing plan with MGM Records to develop a, a response, if you will, to the San Francisco sound, which, of course, was probably a response to the English sound, which was a response to the Motown sound, which was a response to the Memphis sound. Everybody's responding uh, to some sound. He was the guy that made the clear all commercials. That's how he got his sound. He did, he did some, his claim to fame is Neil, Neil Sedaka. He, he oh, produced, really? He did some he stuff. He produced the like, Breaking you know, Up is Hard to Do. He produced okay, that. Good, well, Neil Sedaka wrote some good stuff. He lays claim to producing a lot of things. And so he introdu they introduced us to Alan Lorber, and we had a tremendous rapport with him. We really, really liked him. He really, really liked us and saw the value of what we were doing. We were perfectly suited for what he did. He was a a ranger and a producer responsible for arranging thousands of sides that were very successful. Jackie Wilson, um, Connie Francis, or Connie Stevens, one of Connie Francis, where the boys are. Uh, and he's been, he'd, he's done tons of stuff. He saw the marriage as a wonderful situation for him to be a producer. So we, we felt 
let's, we want to go with him. So though we'd had eight or nine invitations to sign our offers, we went with him because we felt it would be the best one and there was a real rapport with him. He made a terrible mistake. He had some very, very good musicians, some good acts. He signed them and then he tried to market them like you would market Jinsu knives. Now, this was a time, you gotta remember, we're talking 1968, somewhere around that. This was Vietnam. This was RFK and, and Martin Luther King got killed. This was a tough time. And Alan Lorber did a, a kind of a, a, a plastic sort of a promo on this. Um, if he had not, I think you would have heard a lot more of Orpheus and the Spinach and Beacon Street Union and Fluff and Eden's Children and Ford Theater and, and, and all of those guys, because there was talent there. These were talented, talented people. But he tried to cram their stuff down people's throats. The whole idea was, this is a natural place to do this because there are 150 colleges, universities, and secondary schools. Remember, there were CYOs, there were, there were, y, there were high schools, there were college mixers, college mixers at every one of those 150 colleges, universities, and secondary schools, and prep schools, but we uh, played at all of them. And then we find out that there's three bands all being packaged under this Boston sound. I said, really? There's other Boston bands? Who? And we're thinking, is it Ill Wind? Is it Flav? Is it the Hallucinations? Who is it? And then they tell us it's a band called Ultimate Spinach, who we would never heard of in our lives, and a band called Orpheus, who we would never heard of in our lives. And we're thinking, well, wait, we've been in this scene for a couple of years now. I don't remember these bands being from Boston or playing the Tea Party or whatever, so What's going on with this? And so the Boston bands were all maturing. We were young musicians, 20, 21, 22. We were maturing, and it was a tremendous opportunity. And when they looked at us, they being the media, they slammed it because they couldn't see it as a sound. Compared to the psychedelic sound of the San Francisco sound or the Memphis sound, Stax Volt, which comes around that time. There's a definite sound, an R&B has a sound to it. We were really sounds. We used to buy Cashbox and uh, Record World and Billboard, you know, sort of like follow what was going on in the business. And I remember somebody said, there's gonna be an ad for the album this week in Billboard. So we ran to the store to buy the, magazine, you know, and we look and it says something like, it's coming, the shot heard round the world. And we looked at each other and said, what? And it said, and it's on MGM or something. It clearly was referencing us, but yet there was something about it that didn't quite ring true. Like, what do they mean? It's like this. So uh, there were like three weeks of teasers like that. And then the whole thing sort of got unveiled. It was like the boss town sound. And we sort of looked at each other and went, what? This is like queer. This is like really weird. Like, what is this? The major thrust of the Boston Sound was on three bands. The Ultimate Spinach gaining the most attention, the Beacon Street Union, and then Orpheus was sort of uh, an after, if you will, um, thought. Not gain, we didn't, the Spinach did tours. They went to San Francisco. They played at the Fillmore. So the Beacon Street Union Street Union played at, at uh, places in Detroit, Chicago. They really, they went and did these tours. Of course, we had our restrictions due to our home life. And so we didn't do that kind of stuff. Uh, we'd be gone for maybe a day or two, at, uh, but got to scurry right back home. It was too easy for the promoters. Are you kidding? They loved it. Oh, we'll get the three Boston bands together and you know, package a night of Boston sound. I, I saw what, what people liked in them, and I, of course, we did play with them on and off, so I got to see them play live, and I got to see them um, 
uh, know them backstage and get to know them a little bit. So I had definitely had respect for them. It was so weird though, because you know they would come out and ba da 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 da, -da and there we are, boom ba boom 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 boom. You know, it was like the two bands. I mean, it's like, I don't know what the audience was thinking. It's like who, you know, they were there for them, and some of them were there for us, and you know, it was it was, just didn't make any sense. Um, I I think that they had a hard time because uh, more so than w we did because I don't know if you remember that Rolling Stone magazine came out with a story about the Boston Sound calling it hype and um, actually telling it exactly like it was big bunch of money get it together with bands that don't sound like any you know cohesive uh, unity and uh, call it something like they do in Motown and let's go you know that's really what it was and so uh, that hurt Beacon Street Union and it hurts Ultimate Spinach because it was like the, the cool newspaper saying, you guys aren't cool. You guys aren't cool enough. I don't want to be a rusty suit of armor. As we went through this bad period where John Landau wrote this real dump article on all the Boston bands, and of course we were the best sellers, so of course he dumped on us worst. Needless to say, we really bore the brunt of it because, uh, you know, at the time Rolling Stone was just coming into its own. They were writing and reviewing, and they were one of the first uh, national publications to pan it and say, you know, this is BS, don't go for it. Alert, consumer alert, consumer alert. Uh, he's a weasel. Uh, I have no use for the man, and if I was to be in the same room with him, I'd smack him in the nuts. Plain and simple, I would. I mean, you know, that guy caused so much trouble. But basically, after this article he wrote um, in Rolling Stone, all of a sudden, the tide turned. Um, there were a couple of fan clubs in Massachusetts. They actually started getting hate mail and had to discontinue the, the club, because, the clubs, because of the hate mail. Uh, I mean, which to me is amazing, right? Um, so the second album was never really given a good chance because of, of Landau's crap article, you know. But for us, we didn't care about the Rolling Stone magazine, and we were going a whole different direction uh, musically, and that's the direction I wanted to keep going. And the praise that I was getting was not from Rose, uh, not from uh, um, Rolling Stone magazine. Meanwhile, we were getting articles in uh, Time magazine and Newsweek because they were buying the MGM PR machine. So they're talking about the Boston Sound. You know, they would have like the music section. We got reviewed in Downbeat magazine. I have a, somewhere at home, I have a Downbeat magazine review of my drumming on that first album saying I was a good drummer. And I'm thinking, something's wrong with this because I hated the album. I hated the way I sounded on the album and I'm thinking a downbeat reviewer thought this was good. There's something weird. Maybe it's those jazzers. They don't get it. They don't understand what we're trying to really play. I couldn't figure it out. The whole thing was such a weird, weird mess. I saw what, what people liked in them and I, of course, we did play with them on and off so I got to see them play live and I got to see them um, uh, know them backstage and get to know them a little bit. So I had definitely had respect for them. But I didn't really get to know any of these people because we were, you know, doing different things at different times. We didn't play very much with Ultimate Spinach. I can remember playing with them at the tea party after the fact once, I think, but I don't remember any other time. I was really very good friends with uh, Wayne Ulakey, the bass player, all the guys, John Lincoln Wright, who's uh, passed away recently, Dick Weisberg, Bob Rosenblatt, those are the guys that were in the Beacon Street Union. They were friends of mine. They were contemporaries. Actually, we got to know the guys in Orpheus. That's how I got to know Harry, and you know, he's a great guy, and we actually, we got along best with them, with the Orpheus guys. It wasn't me particularly, but there was this kind of competition thing. <laughs> You know, we're better than you are, and it, it was pathetic. I mean, you know, we should have all been banding together and going like, yeah, we're Boston bands, we're cool, you know, but nah, it didn't happen like that. 
I, for one, never felt any kind of a competitive scenario. I felt a collegial, um, you know, we played lots of concerts together. I remember the Constitution Hall, 1969, the Trogs, Beacon Street Union, Orpheus, and The Who. It was, a very, it was a lot of camaraderie, yeah. The, yeah. All the bands really liked each other. I remember we used to go see the Beacon Street Union right. quite a bit. Right. And of course, The Remains, we were at their gigs all the time. It seems like everybody was still friendly in, in the 70s when I was in the Boom Boom Band and there was all these bands and we all supported each other and did gigs together. I don't know when all the competition stuff really came in, maybe in the 80s, I don't know. Maybe just talking through my hat. No, I would have to say the Barbarians, um, I never saw them live, um, I don't think, but um, when I did hear it, or hear them, I knew they were a top group. Uh, I think they were the group that had a one-handed drummer uh, who did a great job, uh, I'll have to say that. So I was very impressed with the Barbarians and with Orpheus. Uh, they really worked more, I think, on their vocal. That was their strength, and they were a very good group. I would say those were probably including ourselves I, with a bias, I would say we were probably the three best groups that came out of Massachusetts during that little block of seven years. I'm sure there are many others since then, but uh, I do remember the Barbarians and Orpheus. Both of them made me sweat, which means they were good. Almost every record we played become a hit because we were the only ones doing it until the, the guys out on the West Coast picked up on it. And uh, we were, you know, there was this huge feeling for it and nobody was feeding it. So uh, uh, I, I wish Lorber hadn't done what he did. So I realized this just wasn't going to be gratifying to me long term, so I went back to college. Uh, nevertheless, the album went ahead with this Timothy Clover touch to it, which was very odd. We were a hard driving, good rock band. We had, by then, I, we brought in another guitar player to take my place. He had a very different style. His was more trained. I think he, uh, Paul Rivers, um, he claimed to have trained at uh, Juilliard or someplace. Uh, basically, he had more of a jazz uh, feel to him. Um, but at that time, they went in to do the album. I came down from Colgate to help out, just to give the Teddy and the Panda sound, and to pitch in. And um, while we were recording, we ended up writing songs left and right. Um, I wrote, wrote one in the hotel room um, at the debutante ball. It was sort of a little farcical thing with a harpsichord and me singing, probably the only time I ever sang a song. Um, and it was a, a cute little ditty, but very funny. It was basically sarcastic about the social register crowd. The album didn't go anywhere. Um, and I think probably within six to nine months, the band sort of fizzled out. If Lober had just brought this material around to BZ, there were a couple of stations that, that were programmed like the KYW in Cleveland. Um, some of the stations out on the West Coast, he would have had his hit and he wouldn't have had the, 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 the pushback that the people who had had it right up to here gave him. And it's just, you know, I guess it's hindsight or something, I don't know. And it ended up destroying the band. I mean, we were all so uncomfortable with it that we, we weren't comfortable on our own skins anymore. And Peter Wolf, told us not to do it. I'm going to give him credit right here and right now. He came to us and he said, what are you guys doing? And we said, oh, what do you mean? We got a record, we got a producer, we're going to record. He says, you're not ready. He said, my band isn't ready. You're not ready. You got to pay your dues. It's never going to work. And we said, come on, you're just jealous. <laughs> he was right. But for one letter, I think, and a few other uh, complications that I can 
discuss, but that to me was as soon as we were marketed as a sound, it became apparent we weren't a sound, we were many sounds. Me, oh.